I'm Jim Carlson and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's theme Thursday, season three, recorded on September 14th, 2017. Theme Thursday is a web gaps, uh, Gallup webcast series that dives deep into the Clifton Strengths themes, one theme at a, th- uh, at a time. Don't, I'm not sure why I'm having trouble talking. Today's theme is analytical. If you have questions, comments, or contributions during this webcast, we do have a live chat room that's available for you right below the main video window. If you just look down there, bottom left-hand corner, there's a login button. Choose that. Choose the guest account. Put your name in where it says guest. Take those numbers out of there. Put your name in. Hit submit. You'll join us in the chat room. Best best way to answer your or ask your questions that are available, uh, and we will answer those in real time as we can. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about uh, custom strengths coaching solutions for small, medium, or large organizations, Contact us here. Send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center. There's gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your coaching resources and strength finder training needs. And you can also catch the video in both streaming and downloadable audio for offline listening. We call that podcasting. And so maybe on your iPhone, your Android phone, you have a podcast app of choice. We'd love to have you listen to us. You can get it downloaded automatically each time it comes out. A great way to recapture that time in a car, on a train, in a plane, those kinds of things. Uh, all the information you need to get that done is available on our coaches blog, 1.3 million views coaches blog out at coaching.gallup.com. Michael Ibrant is our host today. Michael works as a workplace consultant here at Gallup and has officially moved and moved into our new spot. Micah, welcome to another theme Thursday. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Thanks for hanging with me as we did a bunch of sort of in transit theme Thursdays. Good to feel a little more settled. <laughs> Yeah, we are in starting a new domain today. We have analytical on the books, and uh, hopefully folks have downloaded the companion guide for that and can follow along. If you're listening to the recorded version, just stop the video right now. Go download that companion guide. Print it out. We, we find writing is a better exercise than typing, and so print that out and get ready to take some notes. Micah, what do we, uh, we want to dig into today? What do we want to think about as we think about so- analytical? I want to probably, if I had analytical, which I don't, it's number 34 of 34. (laughs) I'd probably challenge on you, challenge you on the, is, is writing actually a better exercise physically? Show me the proof. Show me the data. Where do you get that? Did you just say that specifically as a Gallup finding have studies shown Um, in all seriousness, analytical is about removing any, um, any doubt and really aiming for truth. Um, and I might have it 34, but I do love, love, love this theme. And some of my, um, most beneficial partners, um, professionally and personally have had analytical. So I'm thrilled that we get to dive into it today. Alphabetically, it kicks off our strategic thinking themes. So it is the first that we're going to dive into in the strategic thinking domain. So before I dive too far into analytical, I just want to give some love for all of the strategic thinking themes. Sometimes, I will uh, take the liberty as I'm explaining what these themes are about to replace the word strategic with the word critical um, because strategic itself is one of our themes. Uh, It is the name of the domain. It's not going to change. But I do think sometimes adding other words there helps people think about it. Really what all of these themes summarize is a way that leaders lead that is primarily about thinking in their head. I was um, had a great conversation with a friend last week and she was telling me that she felt felt like uh, she was being selfish anytime that she was blocking out time at work to do some research about an important project. And we really dove into it. And it was amazing because she had a bunch of those thinking themes, but it didn't feel like it was an okay and acceptable or maybe a very popular or common thing to do to really need to spend some time thinking. And I think regardless of which of those strategic thinking themes you lead with, it's important to give yourself some grace and understand that for you, if you lead with some of these thinking themes, that thinking is synonymous with doing and that you will be so much better for others when you give yourself that time to process things through in your mind. Now let's go directly into analytical. This theme is really about uh, a a challenge that I think analytical brings, a challenge in a gracious sort of warm way when it's it's being used in, in really excellent leaders. That challenge is to prove it. Show me what you're claiming is true or show me what we are pursuing is worthwhile or is accurate. Um, If you dive into that companion guide, the first thing you'll find is our long definition. That's what I think about when I think about really going to the source 
course. And so it's fantastic that it's right there for you on that companion guide. Just a few points that I highlight in the long definition here. It's not about destroying other people's ideas. It's not about uh, it, you know putting a pin in a balloon of emotion. It is about insisting that theories be sound. And I think about that as an aspect of, of great partnership or how can that benefit or serve other people. It's a fantastic way to really build I think build a strong foundation on the ideas that people have. So folks with high analytical might see themselves as objective, dispassionate. Um, very often we get, I think the quick characterization of analytical is to say, oh, they like numbers, they like data. That's probably a symptom of liking truth. Um, but but there is something wonderful about data to folks with high analytical is because uh, the data tends to speak for itself. It's not about sifting through in any bias or sifting through any um, sort of subjectivity, it is the quickest um, the quickest avenue sometimes to an answer is to take a look at data. There's not an agenda to it. Um, and if you'll read in the long definition, it says armed with these data, you can better search for patterns and connections. And a lot of analytical is about that search, that looking for how does um, how does what we're claiming speak to what is what is accurate, what is reality. You peel the layers back until gradually the root cause or causes are revealed. So another piece that I love about analytical is that understanding of if then or of cause and effect. Others might see you as logical or rigorous. A couple other words that I wrote down as I was um, speaking with folks with high analytical and also listening to a really great season one uh, of analytical, critical, curious, skeptical, uh, search for understanding, the word consider comes up a lot, uh, refine, and and the word data or the word even error. I think to somebody with high analytical, talking about error doesn't have a negative context necessarily. It has a curiosity context. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot that goes into this theme, plenty to dive into and fall in love with. Now let's talk about what it looks like in leaders. So if as an individual, analytical is seeking understanding through fact, then as a leader, it can be that dispassionate approach to creating a shared understanding, not just how do you process, but how then can you help others process? It is about noticing patterns, about discovering cause and effect, which means discovering relationship. Um, it's about sorting between evidence in search of that pursuit of truth through that pursuit of reality. I think when you think about this um, in really great leaders, it can mean fearlessness in times when, when situations are very emotional or when emotions can lead us to a feeling of instability. When you're the person who's saying, let's peel back the layers, let's look at what's really happening, that can come across as a lot of courage or even, even a sense of fearlessness. Um, I think of analytical as being the ability to in the in the in a stormy situation emotionally analytical can really help us cling to facts cling to proof um, I was reading a, a brand new book from the library to my two-year-old last night. It's called Sweet Dreams, Curious George, a classic. George is a monkey, um, and he read a book before he went to sleep about Chicken Little, which if you're familiar with Chicken Little, Chicken Little thinks the sky is falling. And then, of course, in this story, George can't go to sleep because he thinks the sky is falling. His friend, the man with the yellow hat, takes a great analytical approach and he takes him outside and sets up a telescope and they look at the sky. And it hit me this morning as I was thinking about analytical that it was a really great way to say, I'm here, I'm present with you in your emotional turmoil and I'm gonna help you through it by helping you see fact. And I think about that in a leader as the ability to not discard emotion, but to use emotion as a starting point for new discoveries that perhaps we wouldn't have made if we would have stayed in that emotional place. So in the end, George discovers that there are constellations and that there's more that he can study. He also goes to sleep, which as I was reading this to a two-year-old who doesn't sleep, I was kind of worried that we had taken a detour. But um, <laughs> in the end, his emotions are settled and he discovers discovers a new passion for, for looking at the stars. And so I think about that as a, a real gift that analytical can give to someone, being able to say, 
there is reality here. There's more that we can learn that we don't know yet. And there's something that we can sort to that's going to help us sort of weather the storm of, of, of maybe some other pieces that are a little bit less fact-based. This idea of being critical or skeptical, um, I think it's, you can be trusted not to be swayed by hunches or feelings alone. And I say alone on purpose. You can be trusted to listen, I think, to hunches, to follow them, but also to follow them um, in pursuit of, of what's accurate. And so it's not discarding hunches, it's not discarding feelings, it's using them as a starting point or as a clue, um, as, as some, some evidence that you can gather. Reducing to its essence is probably my favorite uh, phrase that Kurt Liesfeld used to describe analytical. He would often say boiling down to an essence. Um, and and, and I, I, I think about that when I think about analytical. Um, it, it's, it's not just communicating what needs to be communicated, but it's also I, the expansion of that. If you're a leader with analytical, think about communicating when communication needs to happen and also how. I would say what, when, and how are three perhaps different levels of expertise on how you can be an effective leader um, around communication with analytical. A lot that you can think about, a lot that you can boil down. So there's a lot of thoughtfulness, precision, honesty. Um, and again, it's that strategic thinking theme. So spending time boiling things down, spending time in that thoughtfulness is, is essentially leaning into that talent. Um, I think I would encourage you, if you're a leader with high analytical, to study your own analytical. Lean into it and, and analyze it. Get curious about how you do your best thinking. Often I'll ask leaders in a coaching situation, who helps you do your best thinking? Uh, when have you felt the most confident? Uh, how can you work something, it's one of those answers, into a daily practice? Uh, for Depending on your other themes, it might have something to do with other relationships. It might have something to do with pressing deadlines. It might have something to do with research. Um, but really get curious and allow yourself to personalize your answer to some of those questions of, of when you feel uh, that you've done your best thinking. The last thing that I'll cover is our needs of followers, and then I get to introduce um, one of my favorite analytical partners here in just a moment. A leader might use the analytical theme to build trust by this idea from that I took from seventh grade algebra called show your work. When I was in seventh grade, the worst thing that you could do was answer um, an, al an algebra test without showing how you had gotten to the answer that you got to. And I think sometimes it's necessary for uh, leaders with analytical to do a little bit of that. So much of it might happen inside your head. It's not necessarily about that influencing piece, about getting it out of your head or affecting you know, how other people feel. So from time to time, it might be not only necessary, but fascinating to others for you to think a little bit about how did I come to this conclusion? Um, and in many ways, we say similar things about trust and, and all 34 themes is really building that reputation of thoughtfulness um, by showing people that you didn't just follow a hunch, but maybe giving people a taste of what you went through in order to come to the conclusion that you did. I, um, in, in a book I, I recently read, I heard um, compassion described as an absence of judgment. And I think about um, leadership and analytical and compassion as the ability to talk about success objectively. Um, perhaps that leads to more inclusiveness. Perhaps that leads to more understanding. Perhaps that leads to relationships that you wouldn't otherwise build. But I think about that, um, the ability to hire and to introduce people to teams from somebody with high analytical, you can do that without um, it's sort of getting blinded by your gut reaction to a person, really looking for what does excellence look like and describing that outside of somebody's resume, uh, I think can be a, a fantastic description of compassion as that absence of, of being too quick to judge. A leader might use analytical to provide stability by getting to know your own tipping point for confidence. How much data do you need to feel like you can provide stability to others? How much time do you need? What kind of questions do you need to ask? What kind of experiences do you need to have? So discover that point for yourself of when you feel most confident. That will enhance your ability to provide stability to your followers. And the final theme we talk about uh, creating in your followers is hope. So I think about um, analytical being a great 
idea around hope by being able to provide measurements of success for the people who follow you. Think about describing the future in milestones. Include that ability to connect cause and effect. If we can sell 10 more widgets, that will enable us to create XYZ, which will enable you to have a better future. Um, I, I think about uh, that the necessity to measure, to look for improvement, and that propensity to look for truth. Sometimes truth comes back to measurement. So analytical is uniquely, I think, positioned to create some really uh, concrete hope <laughs> in, in, in its followers. There's my quick overview of what analytical looks like and why you should love it in leaders in your life. I'd now like to introduce to you a, a great leader in my life, Benjamin Erickson Farr. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hi, Micah. Hi, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about the glamorous theme of analytical. Glamorous. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Benjamin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your top five? Absolutely. First, I'll say I'm, I've come well prepared. I was just in a meeting where we had to look at a spreadsheet with about 30 columns and 100 rows. So I've got my analytical adrenaline flowing. Uh, and so I'm ready to go. Um, my role here is as a, as a manager or a leader for our global workplace consultant team. Um, these are learning and development experts, and you might know them best as they're, they're the very talented individuals who teach our global classes, um, including the Accelerate Strengths coaching class, a lot of leadership and coach development, and they do many other uh, wonderful things in terms of improving workplaces around the world. So it's my honor to get to, to lead that team. So Benjamin, you have analytical number one, is that right? I sure do. Um, what else do you have in your top five then? Yep. So analytical, connectedness, learner, strategic, and achiever. Before we dive too much past this, I want to hear more about what analytical adrenaline feels like. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I knew I was walking from that meeting to here, and I, I distinctly was present to the feeling of having um, a great positive energy having left a meeting where we were literally looking at a spreadsheet a huge spreadsheet and talking about it and it occurred to me boy that could have been just a real yawner for a lot of people just a terrible <laughs> meeting but i i actually did love it so that's analytical adrenaline for you a little bounce in your step walking from that meeting <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> so benjamin you're a leader you you manage a, a large global team um here at gallup um how does analytical relate to to your leadership and your management um, yeah, so I, I will start with those needs of followers that you outlined, and maybe I'll go through one by one and talk about how analytical helps me with those. Um, I'll start with stability. So stability is a great one. When I think about stability, I'll think about two things. One is tone, another is change. So with tone, I would say uh, one of the great important things about stability is when people come to you, when they come to you with a problem, a challenge, an exciting thing, um, it's important for them to be able to predict the tone of the conversation. They may not be able to predict what I'm gonna say or the outcome of the conversation, but they know what they're gonna get with me with my analytical is I'm gonna hear them, listen to the facts, think carefully about what they said and not overreact. I'll be a dispassionate listener to really help understand what's happening. And I think that's very valuable with my analytical because I feel like that um, creates a sense of emotional stability where people can tell me things and know that they um, there's a safe space for that. Another one is change. So change is unsettling or unstable for people. And I'll say that with change, I think people can count on me with my analytical to know that if we're gonna change, it's been well thought through. I've looked at, I've looked at it from every angle and um, I think there's a lot of stability in knowing that the change isn't just happening because of a feeling or it's a shiny object, but, but because there's been real rigor in the thinking. Um, stability is an interesting one. I'll say stability is something where you oftentimes don't uh, notice the presence of stability, but you become aware of the absence of, of stability. In other words, I don't. you're not thankful that there's the ground's not shaking beneath you, but when the ground's shaking beneath you and there's instability, you really hope there's stability. So it's an important one. I think analytical is well positioned to provide that as a leader. Um, the second one is hope. So hope's an interesting one. I think it's um, analytical isn't a particularly future oriented theme, but there are some ways where I've found that analytical can provide hope. Mikey, you were referencing this. I think one of the great ways I like to provide hope with my analytical 
is to show bar graphs, very simple bar graphs that show three and five year upward trends of things <laughs> moving in the right direction. It sounds so simple, but man, that provides hope for people. We're moving in the right direction. That very simple chart, which is a distillation of a lot of data, is showing us that we're moving in the right direction. I have hope that we're gonna keep because there's a, keep doing that because there's a trend. The second thing about hope is uh, I'll talk about this uh, this concept called the Stockdale Paradox. So Admiral Stockdale was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And when he was talking, when he was interviewed about people who survived, he said people who struggled were actually optimists because they actually had false hope. They said, oh, I'll be out by Christmas. I'll be out by Easter. And when they weren't, it became very debilitating. He said for him, the key was first being able to confront the brutal facts. And then having the knowing that you have the determination and courage to make it despite those facts. And I think analytical can provide hope by first confronting the brutal facts. So I'm not a Pollyannish. I'm not going to tell you that things are going to be great because I don't know that they're going to be great all of the time. But I will tell you, here's what's happening now. And let's talk about things we can do to make it better to get to where we want to be. So it's, it's, a, it's a slight shift or a nuance, but it's about first looking at reality. And I think that provides hope for people because you can almost exhale when you confront that maybe things aren't what they need to be now. The next so one, Benjamin, before you yeah. go too far, I, what was really standing out to me about that is oftentimes, I think there's, a, Shane Lopez gives us a great two-sided definition of hope. He says that it's the belief that tomorrow's gonna be better and that I have the ability to make it so. I think when I think about hope, I err on the tomorrow side of it. It sounds like analytical can really help us with the that second part of it of how can you really get to where you're going, um, which paints hope for me in, in a, a place that I hadn't thought about it. It's not just here's what's gonna, here's where we're going, let's get better. It's, um, it's how, how, how are we going to improve that, that almost pragmatic side of it that is until now in my mind overlooked? Yes, it's the pragmatic side of hope, I guess. It's first where maybe a little bit about where we've been, where are we now? What can we do to get to that better future? Yes. That's powerful. Thanks. Um, you've got two more themes there uh, that you're still going through. Wonderful. And feel free to stop me after each one. Um, trust. Okay, so trust. Um, I've had people say to me, particularly when I'm talking about something that's going to happen that's uncertain, is they say, you know, because you're saying it with your analytical, I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what they mean is, as I'm probably not going to predict uncertain events, or I'll probably even literally say, well, I think it's going to happen. Here's how likely it is, rather than saying this is going to happen. There was this um, show in the 1980s called Quantum Leap. And... Uh, he would go back in the past and then he would have this companion who would tell him, okay, what you've done now, now there's a 75% chance that the future is going to work out this way or an 82% chance. In a way, that's how analytical looks at the future. Uh, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, given what's happening now, I think the odds are in our favor that it's going to happen this way. But I'm, I'm very loath to say it will happen. I think the future is uncertain. But I could, I mean, I, you can't really assign a percentage, but I probably think in terms of percentages with the future. Mm -hmm. But I think when I'm saying there's a relative certainty, people trust that. Um, the second thing is, um, is maybe, maybe you've referenced it before, but it's the trust formula that we talk about sometimes, uh, the David Meister. And so the trust formula, without going into too much detail, there's four components, credibility, reliability, intimacy, and then low self-orientation. Uh, or others orientation would be another way to look at it. And in that, I think analytical is really my companion on the credibility piece related to the trust. So that is, can people trust what you're saying? And I think analytical, because I'm typically saying things after having thought about them or researched them, I think people can trust what I say. So it gives me credibility, which is an important part of trust. The reliability, just so you know, I would say that's more my achiever. Am I going to do what I say? So I have to get out of my head and start doing it. The intimacy is probably more my relator. Am I going to get to know you um, as a person? And the low self-orientation or high others orientation is probably more my connectedness. It's this idea of really kind of thinking of others and, and how this is going to affect all of us. Uh, but that, that's, that's how analytical plays in, in the trust equation, if you will. 
Finally, compassion. So actually, probably if I were to say, what, what theme do I lean into for compassion? I'd go back to my connectedness again. It's almost in the definition. You're caring, you're considerate. Uh, but with analytical, I'd say I liked what you were talking about. It's non-judgmental. So um, I, I think it's kind of being able to take in the data of who a person is and accept them for who they are. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not, not needing to change people. And there's compassion and just saying, okay, I see you for who you are. Uh, that's compassionate. Uh, the other thing, there's a specific example I can bring up where it's how can data help you show compassion? There was a person on my team who we were in a very busy period. She was feeling very overwhelmed. And I saw this, she didn't. And what, what, what I saw was she was in a busy period, but there was actually going to be a period coming up where it wasn't as busy. So I actually just took the time to make a little chart that showed you're in the middle of a very busy eight weeks. But here, look at the next eight weeks. They're going to be fine. And she actually came like with an exhale saying that's, she used the word compassion as you showed you cared by showing me what my schedule is. And it really was a relief. So I guess that's a way analytical can be used for compassion, showing you care. I love that idea. I, I think about sometimes it's hard and I wanted to go to, well, you probably pull on other themes for compassion, <laughs> but it's so obvious here now that it, it just looking into it, um, that, that, that shows that you cared, which is probably a great way to just ask yourself about compassion is how do you show that you care? You know, every theme has some access to, to doing that. I'm curious, Benjamin, do you use charts because they help tell the story to others or because they make it more clear to yourself? Could you have done that without a bar graph? Um, I, I do that without bar graphs for others. I think, I think writing it down or seeing it helps me, um, helps me kind of see a picture, capture it. Oftentimes though, what I'll do when I'm presenting it to others, and this is a characteristic of analytical is I'll simplify it as much as possible. We talk about boiling it down to the essence. So really, I know that a lot of information can confuse people. It can create more instability uh, or more confusion. So if I'm going to show something to someone else who probably doesn't think the same way I do, I'll distill it to where it's just crystal clear what what I think it I think the data says in, in a way that they can understand. What's your process like? How do you do that distillation? Well, it would almost be like, let me see the source or let me see the raw data, right? So oftentimes when I'll see someone do what I do, which is produce kind of the, the summary, mm -hmm. I'll want to be like, hmm, I'd love to see the raw data that goes into that summary just to make sure I agree with that summary. Because I think it's seeing everything. With analytical, you're good at seeing patterns in data. So I like to see the data first so I can be the person seeing the pattern. Um, and I think that helps, that helps me. So that's my process. By the way, I will say this about data. Um, data, we often think of numbers, quantitative data, but I think there is qualitative data, what people are saying and um, feelings. So I think this is something that you have to remind yourself with analytical feelings or facts is something we say at Gallup, behavioral economics. And I think there's a big piece to, if a lot of people are feeling a certain way, that's evidence to me. I'm not charting that, but I'm paying attention to it and I'm not ignoring it. I'm not saying, well, there's numbers over here that are telling me what you're feeling is not true. I'm counting that evidence because it matters a lot. Is that something that you've had to, that you've always done? Or is that a different extension of your analytical that you've developed? You know, I've always been in tune with feelings and probably it's through my connectedness, maybe individualization or other themes. Um, I guess it's been in tune with the mood, um, but I guess it's probably my analytical that's kind of looking around and thinking about what it means. I guess to use an example, like if you're a telepath, you can read minds. If you're an empath, you can read feelings. I'm not an empath. So I can see feelings, but I can't feel feelings, I guess. Um, with analytical, I'm more seeing feelings, observing feelings, not feeling them. So um, people have accused me of, oh, you read my mind. Or how did you know what I was saying? I barely even described it. But it's, I think it's, it's a combination of strategic and analytical. But I'm able to, I already have collected a lot of data about you. Um, it's not like I'm going through a, a conscious process. But I know a lot about you already. And so uh, what, based on what you said, that was just that big enough clue where it fell into place for me. And it feels, I do know how you're feeling. Or I understand how you're feeling because of what you said. 
Sorry, there's yeah. a gnat flying in my face. <laughs> it's all right. It's, you're, you're you're powering through the gnat attack. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, it's it's like I didn't read your mind. I paid attention to you. Right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, and that can feel like reading your mind uh, uh, because I I think sometimes paying attention as a leader, if this is about leaders, paying attention to people, if you're doing that well, uh, you're getting a lot a lot of things right. Gosh. We need to quote that and turn it into a tweet. <laughs> Benjamin, as a leader, you've you've done a great job talking about um, how you how you help your followers, but there's more than just that one direction that you have to affect and work with other people. Where do you notice analytical showing up in in other relationships that you have at work? Yeah, so I think if you think about the relationships that a, a manager has, there's also your peers and then leaders leaders within the organization. Um, executives. So with peers, I know that I'm counted on to, um, for one, is to help to help show what's happening on their team in a way that others can understand. So oftentimes I'll help by I'll listen to what the, what's happening in their world, and then I'll almost help translate, if you will, what I heard into a simplified version that 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 can be ex explained to other people. So I'm in a sense sorting through all of what they do to get to the basic of what they do that's gonna help other people here. So I do help peer managers with that. Um, and then with leaders, I'll say it's interesting, uh, anyone who's a manager has had to give a presentation to executives, uh, What you, your first instinct is to go and throw the kitchen sink at them because you wanna show them that a lot's happening while you're super busy, you, you really know what you're doing, so you have all this information, you wanna wow them, right? So, um, I actually do the opposite and um, it works really well with my analytical. So I'll look at everything I got and then what they really want is just a high level overview that really captures the core of the what they're interested in. And my analytical really helps me sort through all the clutter and come with one pagers, a couple of slides where they understand my whole business or whatever it is our topic is. And um, our CFO has has said more than once out of meetings, I'm told that I make great charts. So that's actually a really nice compliment. Uh, but I think what I think what, what, how I take that is I'm able to get a lot of information down to just something that's really core because then then they don't need the details. That's my job to manage the details. Uh, they just need to understand at a high level what's happening and that it's going well, hopefully. <laughs> Oh my God, Becky, look at that chart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, I played that song uh, in high school once and got in big trouble. It's like the most trouble I've ever been in my life. <laughs> I, play, I played it over the PA system in, in high school. Uh, I had to go to the principal's office. Did you analyze the risk of doing that before you did? or? <laughs> No, it was, it's a long story, but basically <laughs> someone else put it in at the last second. I'm sure if I had had a day to think it through, it wouldn't have happened, <laughs> but I was there and I could have stopped it. So I take responsibility if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> to all of your high school. Speaking yes. of high school, what, ha what did analytical look like when you were, uh, when you were younger? Oh, being good at math. I don't know. <laughs> Liking math, being good at math. It's probably that simple. Uh, I don't know. I can't really describe it any more than that. I will say this. Uh, one time someone said to me, oh, learning, so math is left brain, learning a language is right brain. And that's probably that You know that is analytical brain. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said prefrontal cortex yet, but um, <laughs> I think what they mean by right brain, it's like that artistic side, you're, you're kind of learning and integrating. But actually for me, I do speak Spanish. I learned it a very left brain way which is memorizing vocabulary, vocabulary, understanding the structure. So I approach things in a more of a structured way than a, I don't just go in not knowing anything and become a conversationalist. I like understand the structure, memorize words, and then I can learn a language. So that's an analytical uh, way to learn a language in high school too even. Oh, wow. My whole world just lit up on why I almost failed out of my Spanish minor. <laughs> because <laughs> I learned it the opposite way. I had the the pleasure in my in my sense of conversational courses um, yes. and then totally couldn't do the learn the vocabulary, take the exam style. Uh, that's yeah. fascinating. Speaking of, of, of speaking a different language, does analytical show up for you outside of work? 
Yes, of course, analytical shows up everywhere, uh, as, as would uh, all my signature themes. But I would say a book I've read recently that could probably sum up my life and, and why I love analytical is the book called Essentialism. It's a great book. It's called A Disciplined Pursuit of Less, it says. And I'll just read a quick thing I have written down. It's a systematic discipline for discovering what is absolutely essential, eliminate all else, all else so we can make the highest contribution to what matters. And I'd say that could be a description for analytical. Um, you could, I think there's a little maximizer and some other strengths in there, but okay, essentialism. It's really looking at what matters and and it's sorting through and, and eliminating things that don't. And so that takes on uh, a range of things in my entire life, whether it's my priorities in terms of how I spend my time with my family, um, how I make financial decisions, uh, uh, you know, pretty much, it pretty much spreads throughout my, my entire life. And I think the essentialism at its core, it's about opportunity cost because there's so many great things. We all have the great blessing of living in modern society and you have lots of good options. And I think the idea is that having a lot of good options and saying yes to all of them is actually not a blessing. It's a curse. Mm -hmm. uh, just as presenting lots of information is not a blessing. It's a curse. But the blessing is to have those options and then to do enough critical thinking to say, what really matters to me? How, what's my biggest contribution in my professional life and my personal life? And that's what essentialism is. And I think analytical helps do that sorting. And, and, and so that's how I would apply it. Is it something you do on purpose? Do you have essentialism discussions with your family or is it something that just sort of happens accidentally? I'd say it's a combination. So yes, probably I, I'm inclined that way. Um, just as like someone who doesn't like the idea of essentialism at all, probably no matter how hard they work at it, isn't gonna do it. So I probably tend that way. But at the same time, there's investment. Um, if, I, if, if it's something that I'm drawn to, a strength, if you will, the more I invest in it, the more I'm intentional about it. Imply, uh, reading a book is investment. Aiming it at something is, is applying it. And I do both. And the more intentional I am, the happier I am because it's congruent with who I am. Benjamin, one of the things that I really appreciate about you, because I get a chance to work with you all the time, which is great, is this idea. I like this um, predictability of thought for you. Now, we, we, you were talking about essentialism. And I think for those of us, you know, I have all those, all those strategic thinking themes kind of down towards the bottom. And I'm all action. Like, let's get things moving. Let's get things going. But and I've always dreamt of a day when I could actually be like that, but it, it always fails. I've really got to lean on you uh, in our situations. I know coming in that if I've got something I want somebody to think about, think about it right or get some data from, you're, you're my guy. Do you find in team roles uh, where among your peers, can, can you observe others relying on that as well? Do you have any great examples where, you know, your charts, by the way, now you're going to do all my charts for me. Now that you know. <laughs> no thanks, I don't need more work, Jim. Thank you. Going <laughs> forward, you're my chart guy. Uh, but can you do you sense that in in teams that you've been in? Do you become that guy? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, there's a management initiative we're working on, and um, I won't get into the details. But basically, what ends up happening is every time we have to leave and come up with a new chart to show what we've talked about, and it's not like who's going to do that. I just, <laughs> it's just, I walk out and do it and come back to the next meeting with that. And then I try again. So absolutely. I'm that guy. I will say something though, Jim, that, um, if I were to talk about some of the areas of analytical where I need help. So if I were to say what, what is one of the, um, potentially negative outcomes of analytical, it's that it can be slow. And so I need people who can be fast and you're someone who can be fast with your activator. Who's going to get it moving? Now, I have Achiever. To a certain extent, I can speed myself up. But honestly, like, I probably have more slow themes than fast themes. In other words, I like to think. And both are valuable. But um, so I think that the same truth applies for me. When it's time for action, I love having partners who can help me with that. It's a, it's a ton of fun for me. I need oftentimes as partners, I need that predictability. Uh, because I have so little of it, and and that in there's very powerful ways that comes in handy. I was telling Mike McDonald, who's a good friend of ours, uh, yesterday. Mike's been on the program as well. That I'm a better firefighter than a farmer, 
And so I love to be in those situations where it's constantly changing. I have to be constantly moving. I don't need the data. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'll take gut instincts. You know, I will. And sometimes those pay off and sometimes they don't. I do think we envy your predictability. We envy your ability to think critically through it. Dave in the chat room, we're just talking. I had tweeted one of his. uh, He put that quote in here and I tweeted it out during the show. And he said, well, uh, Frank Newport, one of our, our other podcasters here, has been encouraging people, you know, thinking that Facebook and Twitter take away from that critical thinking ability, this idea, I, I imagine for folks, I don't know, maybe you can talk about this, Benjamin, for, for individuals who have high analytical, these very quick hitting social media distractions take away from that. Before I go any farther, do you sense that? I mean, do you struggle with those, th- this, you know, this social media kind of stuff that we're going through? Uh, well, I can speak personally. I'm not a big social media guy and I do attribute it to some of my strengths, including analytical. So I do agree with that. And, uh, to make a broader comment, actually there's two, one, you talked about predictability. I'll come back to that, but to answer your question about, um, sound bites or uh, social media, like I, I go back to the, the book by, um, Gallup senior scientist, emeritus, Danny Kahneman, who talks about, it's called thinking fast and slow. And I do think there's a bias in the modern world towards thinking fast. And actually, judgment about thinking fast and slow, they're both valuable. Thinking fast is about really going with your gut, but it's, but it's also more about just, think, just making decisions based on your experience. And that's, that's all really good and positive, and we need a lot of that. Like, we couldn't function in the world without just making quick decisions. At the same time, I think in business and society, we could probably use more thinking slow time. Because we could prevent a lot of things that are happening. We could prevent bad investments. We could prevent bad decisions if we just all slowed down and thought about it rather than shiny object or group think. So I am a big proponent of thinking slow. And I think it helps me be more predictable. And I I do like opportunities to have a thinking slow conversation and partnership with people. I think it plays into a really important part, especially how we respond to people. And in leadership, I think this is key. Um, even though it's not a theme for me, I think, um, or a, yeah, a theme for me, I think there's times I could benefit by just consciously channeling you a little bit and slowing down in that thought, right? I mean, I think we find in leadership that's the, that's more important than less. And just look at Facebook threads and the way people respond to each other. If we managed people, like some people respond to Facebook, it's a horrible experience, And I think we just, there are times as you're talking about as leaders, we need to channel a little bit of that predictability, channel a little bit or get some help or figure out a way to do it and respond a little bit slower. I found times when I've been leading and I respond too quickly, I miss moments when I just kind of let those go. Do do, Do you feel, can you respond to that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. So a couple of things there. One is I will not be the first to jump into an email thread unless I feel like I can stop the email thread. <laughs> but in general, I'm going to let it play out and be uh, most of the time it will resolve itself or I can kind of let's see how everyone feels and then jump in. So I'm going to take my time on that. Secondly, as I was talking about stability, it's not those snap judgments. And typically I won't even give an initial reaction when someone's coming to me with an issue or problem or something emotional. Like, okay, I've I'll just listen, 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 listen. And then I might even say, let me think about it. Or I'll be thinking about it as they're talking and then give a very measured response. And I find that that's very helpful because um, the first reaction may inflame it or make it worse. And so it's it's slowing down there. Uh, one, one huge example, we had this big, big, big global course rollout last year. And uh, people kept commenting to me is, wow, I'm amazed how calm you look. I'm amazed how calm you look, right? Or it's like, it's not even happening. And people were predicting chaos. Um, and really it's just because I I just took time and thought it all through. I had complete confidence that we could execute the entire time. In fact, so much so people who weren't used to working with me um, up front, they actually started to get a, lot, a little bit nervous because they're like, they didn't think enough was going into this because I think a typical way to respond to something like that would be to have lots of meetings and lots of drama and lots of conversations. It's like, no, I got this. But what I had to do to Micah's point is to show your work. It's like, no, I had the math answer, but I had to, with my new partners, I had to bring them along and show them my work so that they felt like there was, there was certainty or enough certainty that, that we could get it done. Micah, you made an interesting comment in the chat room that Kurt had high analytical and yet 
still was very active in some ways on Facebook and Twitter, yet he was very strategic about the way he approached it. And, and I think folks, high analytical, it, you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater in this case. No. You, you can be involved there. But Kurt wasn't on it all the time. Not like me. Like people have made comments like, Jim, do you ever sleep, right? Are you ever not on it? That is, I, I am. I respond very, very quickly. I think those are high in, in, in analytical can still be a part of it, but less often and more thoughtful. And like you said, uh, Benjamin, you said, I only, res I only respond if I can get this thing stopped. <laughs> <laughs> That's my goal is to stop it. <laughs> Not to keep it going. Like uh, Micah knows I'm, I'm on like a, an, an anti-reply all uh, mission at Gallup. Crusade? Uh, is crusade. there a stronger word than mission? <laughs> crusade, yes. Uh, because I, I think it's oftentimes counterproductive. It's distracting people. Um, but with Kurt, um, so he actually wasn't a huge chart number guy with his analytical. I think it was number nine for him. But with Twitter, for example, when he tweeted the theme pairs, he loved that and he attributed partly to his analytical because it forced him to do something very complex, which is theme dynamics in very few words. That's a highly analytical exercise. Similarly, pretty much everyone's favorite tool who's attended our accelerated course is the theme inside cards. It's taking the complexity of a theme and putting it into very simple categories. You could put those theme inside cards on a spreadsheet, by the way, because if, they, if you imagine how they're written, it's making them very simple and just making it crystal clear for people, highly analytical writing exercise, the theme inside cards as well. Yeah, teaching with him, I'd always have people ask, um, he must have really high communication. And so I remember the first time I ever taught with him, probably a decade ago, um, I said, hey, where's your communication? You know, I followed that common sort of jump. And he goes, I, I, I don't know. But my analytical is how I can say all these things that people end up writing down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Micah, we, uh, as we kind of bring this in for a landing uh, today, any final thoughts as we think uh, through this last little bit of analytical? I have one just kind of burning question about analytical for Benjamin and then another sort of closing question. So Benjamin, do you, do you find that you need to think by yourself or do you, how do you invite people to think with you? Is there a point where you need to have done the homework with the door closed? Uh, yeah, so I, I will say I prefer to have thought about a topic before we meet about a topic. Um, so to answer your question, I do like to think alone. I like to go for walks. I, I, I feel like I get actually stressed or frustrated when I don't have enough think time. So yes, um, that said, if, if it's a new topic for me, I can track and follow. It's not like I'm stressed in the moment, but I feel like I'm at my best when I've thought about it beforehand and processed. I was thinking about that when you're talking about, you know, a big, a good, big global rollout of anything and how you can be calm and comfortable if you've done that homework. Um, and if when the, the opposite of analytical is that group think or that shiny object piece, I, I imagine a great leadership extension of analytical is being the voice in the room who helps us all slow down a little bit. Yeah. So typically what I'll do is so suppose I were thrown into a meeting about that. All I would do is sit and listen to everyone opine about it. And then I wouldn't say anything. And then I would go and actually look at the right answer or what I thought it was. And then the next meeting, I'd say, here's what we should do, right? So I wouldn't even get involved in the first one because like, I, I don't know enough to, to give an opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's cool. It's, it's a real commitment again to a discovery, to curiosity, to, to accuracy. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I have no analyticals because I also have very low discipline. <laughs> It takes a lot of a lot of discipline there. Um, so in closing, Benjamin, I'm just curious. This is a great way just to ask about your journey with analytical. If you were going to advise, and I say advise, not coach, flat out give advice to other leaders with analytical, what would you want them to know? Well, I'll start with advice in general to a leader. And I'll say, first of all, if you're not interested in, in other people, um, in what they do best, in what motivates them, and what's their great con greatest contribution, then don't be a leader of people. Take on another job where you can go pursue your own interests. It's a high others orientation. In the terms of analytical, it's about collecting data or facts about people. But if you say it that way, it doesn't sound that interesting. But I think it almost transcends any themes. You can use any theme to do it. But unless that's a true value of yours, go into a different profession. There's lots of ways to contribute to the world. But if you're not waking up every day very interested in that and helping other people, then um, 
there's probably a better use of your time. For analytical specifically, I'll say analytical is, a, is an incredibly valuable and powerful strength. Um, there's three things that, that potentially it can be slow, as I mentioned, it can be skeptical, and it can be serious. The three S's of analytical. Um, don't let the slow get in your way. It can as a leader. Find partners and find other strengths and resources within yourself to make decisions when you have to. You'll never be certain. There's no such thing. There's a time to move when you've collected enough information. Skeptical. It's okay to be skeptical and want to find truth. It's not okay to judge, to make people feel dumb. It's not okay to, to squint or make a frowny face when people are talking to you. Um, so you have to manage it. And you have to be respectful for people despite your skepticism and help people find and help people find the truth and come along with you. Sometimes that's showing your work. Um, sometimes that's just being wise enough not to say anything because challenging them in that moment isn't going to serve the greater good. Finally, serious. This is probably the hardest one of all. Analytical is a serious theme. Find ways to have fun. Find ways to enjoy your team. Find ways to enjoy your job and enjoy your life. Part of it's in adrenaline, uh, analytical adrenaline, but honestly, that's it, there needs to be more than that. Uh, lean into something where you can just uh, have a good time. Oftentimes, it's mental. Mental act activity is fun for you. But remember, life and work and everything, it's not worth it if it's not fun. So find a way to lighten up with your analytical. Perfect way to wrap that, Benjamin. Thanks so much for um, really helping us honestly fall in love with this theme uh, through what you've been able to analyze and, and dive into. And um, it very, very fittingly, you've boiled analytical down to a, a real understandable, lovable essence. Uh, but in a broader context, thank you for putting that to work every day and for aiming it at people and for being curious about how you can make uh, make our contribution uh, all the more worthwhile and, and effective. Uh, I appreciate you being here with us and appreciate the work that you do. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate both of you. You bet. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center. It's gallupstrengthcenter.com. Send us your questions or comments. Uh, you can send those directly to us, coaching at gallup.com. You can also catch the recorded audio and video of this program as well as all the past ones and the links to know how to do everything that we do is on our resources page on the coach's blog. Just go to coaching.gallup.com and look for the tab that says resources. If you're interested in becoming a Gallup certified strengths coach, Benjamin is talking about, he leads those, those folks that go out and do that teaching on that. All the courses that lead to certification and even some that don't, but are great learning are available on our course on our courses site, go to courses.gallup. Dot com, or you can fill out the contact form right there on the live page. If you found this helpful, and you should, we ask that you'd share it. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And we'll say goodbye, everybody.